Okay, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So I'll read one verse from the Srimad Bhagavad Gita, 1865. Manmana Bhava Bhakto Manyajimam Namaskuru Mamme Vaisyasi Satyam Te Pati Jane Priyosime Manmana Bhava Mad Bhakto Mamyaji Mam Namaskuru Mamme Vaisyasi Satyam Te Prati jane priyosime manmana bhava mad bhakto madhyaji mam namaskuru mam me vaisyasi satyam te prati jana priyosime Manmana Bhavamad Bhaktu Mamyaji Mam Namaskuru Mami Vaisyasi Satyam Te Parijana Biyosime Manmana Bhavamad Bhaktu Mamyaji Mam Namaskuru Ami Vaishyasi Satyam Te Vidijane Priyosime Matmana Thinking of me, Krishna Bhava Just become Mad Bhakta Krishna's devotee Mat Yaji Worship Krishna Mam Unto Krishna Namaskuru, offer your obeisances. Mum, mum, unto Krishna. Eva, certainly. Avsasi, Avsasi, you will come. Satyam, truly. Te, to you. Pratijane. Krishna promises, Priya, dear, Asi, you are, may, to Krishna. Okay, so, uh, translation, always think of me, always think of Krishna, become my devotee, worship Krishna, and offer your homage unto Krishna. Thus you will come to Krishna without fail. I promise you this because you are Krishna's very dear friend. <laughs> I just wanted to take myself out of the <laughs> out of the mix, you know. <laughs> okay. The most confident parts of knowledge is that one should become a pure devotee of Krishna and always think of him and act for him. One should not become an official Meditator, life should be so molded that one should always have the chance to think of Krishna. One should always act in such a way that all his daily activities are connections with Krishna. He should arrange his life in such a way that 24 hours he cannot think of anything but Krishna. And the Lord's promise is that anyone who is in such pure Krishna consciousness will certainly return to the abode of Krishna where he will be engaged in the association of Krishna face to face. This most confidential part of knowledge is spoken to Arjuna because he is a dear friend of Krishna. Everyone who follows the path of Arjuna can become a dear friend of Krishna and attain the same perfection as Arjuna. 
These words stress that one should concentrate his mind upon Krishna, the very form with two hands carrying a flute, the bluish boy with a beautiful face and a peacock feather in his hair. These are descriptions of Krishna found in the Brahma Samhita and other literature. One should fix his mind on the original form of Godhead, Krishna. One should not even divert his attention to other forms of the Lord. The Lord has multi-forms as Vishnu, Narayan, Rama, Raha, etc. But a devotee should concentrate his mind on the form that was present before Arjuna. Concentration of the mind on the form of Krishna constitutes the most confidential part of knowledge and this is disclosed to Arjuna because Arjuna is the most dear friend of Krishna. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Sri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gorvani Pacharine Ivase Sasunyavari Pasyat Yare Sitarine Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasari Gaur Bhakti Vindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Rama Hari Hari, Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Krishna. <laughs> All right, he's speculating. <laughs> okay. That was a Freudian slip. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, so this verse is from the 18th chapter, the last chapter in Bhagavad Gita, verse number 65. And this verse is the complete understanding of the process of bhakti. What is that complete process? It's divided into four activities as mentioned here. To think of Krishna always. To become the devotee of Krishna and not devotee of anything else. Just Krishna. And to uh, worship Krishna. That means that there's different ways to worship Krishna such as worshiping the deity Worshipping Krishna by chanting his holy name, worshipping the Lord in different forms, uh, and Krishna. And the last one is offer your obeisances, homage. Homage means obeisances, in other words, to fall flat in front of the, the Lord in submission. So these four activities constitute the entire process of the activities of bhakti. Philosophy centers around these four activities, but these are the activities of bhakti. And Krishna makes this verse, this statement, in the first two lines twice. He says it again. Well, he says that this is the second time. The first time he sends it in the ninth chapter, verse number 34, except the last line is a little different than the last line in this verse. But this is the essence of Krishna consciousness. So when we talk about Bhagavad Gita, we look for where the essence is found. So this verse, and then there's another verse that Srila Prabhupada very carefully pointed out, which he said was the essence of Bhagavad Gita, and that's in the fourth chapter, verse number nine. Um, was that Virjanma Karma Chime Divam Avam Yobeti Tatva Taktwa Deham Purna Janmari Naiti Mameti Surjuna? That one who knows the transcendental nature of my appearance and activities in this world does not, upon leaving this body, again take birth, but attains to my abode, O son of Kunti. So this verse kind of illustrates this one also. So knowing the nature of the Lord's transcendental activities and appearance will be uh, facilitated by this particular verse here, by thinking of Krishna, uh, becoming his devotee, worshiping him, and uh, offering your obeisances to him. So this constitutes the most confidential part of knowledge, as Prabhupada says twice within the purport. He wants to make the emphasis of how important that this verse is. So, um, 
to always think of Krishna is sometimes we think, well, how is that possible? It's, it sounds impossible because we're not accustomed to always thinking of Krishna. And when we try, we find that it becomes very hard, or what I say, awkward, to always try to think of Krishna. But the more we become practice in Krishna consciousness, the more it becomes easy to think of Krishna. Whereas for some devotees, to not think of Krishna is hard. In other words, the opposite becomes the reality. There are, Prabhupada said, I cannot n not think of Krishna. It's not possible for me not to, to forget Krishna even for a moment. So, of course, that's Srila Prabhupada, but we also have different degrees of how the level we can come to that stage of always remembering Krishna. And Krishna makes his remembrance in different forms of himself, in his deity form, in his prashadam, in his holy name, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, in the association of his devotees. But he also makes himself known in the sense that one of the most important parts of our uh, development in Krishna consciousness is to see things in relationship to Krishna. In other words, everything you see or everything that's in creation is Krishna's energy. So there, what the devotee does, using the mental uh, activities, he connects the, the energy with the source. And that way he connects whatever you, one sees in this world with the source, the creation, the creator. Creation is connected to the creator. And therefore one sees Krishna in everything. Um, this is Krishna's temple, uh, the stones on the ground are part of the energy of Krishna, and therefore, ultimately, the ingredients that make up the stones are coming from Krishna. So in the sense that his energies, or energy, material energy, is connected with Krishna through the process of thinking of this in that way, and that way we connect with Krishna directly. So that way we can always remember Krishna, either directly or through his energy. But that's the idea, is to always remember Krishna. In fact, to forget Krishna, the Shastras really admonish a person who does. In other words, it becomes something that is a deviation. So, uh, because naturally the soul is pure, and naturally the soul's consciousness is always filled with uh, thoughts of Krishna in one form or another. So to always remember Krishna is is uh, something we have to develop as we practice bhakti and at the same time practice remembering Krishna. Mm -hmm. um, there's ways of remembering Krishna. Uh, we mentioned a couple. Another way is to be able to fix the mind upon Krishna by thinking of Krishna within the mind. Of course, the mind likes to think of so many different things, and the mind is always coming up with different ways to find some kind of something to think about or do. The mind is chanchala, it's restless. But one can practice thinking about Krishna, so it's very important that when we come to the temple, we take a nice darshan of the deities, and that, that impression of the deities is left within our mind like a snapshot is left of the image that it's being taken of. So that we can keep the image of the deities in our mind, and that is thinking of Krishna in that way. So these are, there are many different ways that you can remember Krishna. And as you practice remembering Krishna more and more, then it becomes easier and more natural. And then Krishna also helps you because he knows if you want to remember him, he helps you remember him. So when you forget him, he'll do something to help you remember him because he knows that's what your desire is. But if you don't have the desire to remember Krishna, then it's hard because Krishna is going to fulfill what desire that you are you know, trying to make important in your life. So if we keep that foremost, I want to remember Krishna always, and then we get help from Krishna. And then sometimes when we walk along 
and we bang our toe on the ground, we think, oh, Krishna, oh, that's good. My sister, she's, she was a practicing devotee for many years, and then she left Krishna consciousness. So when she was living in her house, uh, one day she was uh, walking down the street where she lived, and a dog, a big dog, barked. And it was really frightening, and uh, she got fr frightened, and she immediately said, Krishna. And then she told me this story. She said, wow, how did I do that? I haven't th thought of Krishna or chanted anything for years. And now, when this dangerous situation appeared, some fearful situation, her immediate response was to call out Krishna. <laughs> so I said, yeah, that Krishna is de deep within your heart. Although you forget him, he doesn't forget you. <laughs> and situations will bring uh, remembrance of Krishna in different ways like that. But if we practice, it becomes natural to remember Krishna. Krishna says, become my devotee. We are his devotees naturally. This is mentioned in the Shastras. To be a devotee of Krishna is our nature. And to be a devotee means to devote ourselves to activities that will please Krishna. So this is um, what it means to be his devotees, serve Krishna in different ways. And that is the expression of devotion. Worshipping him is another form of serving him. But worship sometimes is more direct. It's more done in temples or in prayer. Whereas uh, becoming his devotee, we can worship him in so many different ways. The worship is more direct. And offering your homage means, Prabhupada said, pay your obeisances to the Lord. This submission to, towards the Lord is illustrated by obeisances. So it's important that we practice this principle of paying obeisances. And then when we pay our obeisances, we chant the prana mantras of our spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada, like that. So that is obeisances. And uh, so sometimes I see devotees after so many years of practice, they do a, what is it called, this real short inversion of obeisances. They go down and they put the head on the floor and they don't want to get the head dirty, so they come up right away. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> so they come up right away. I don't want to get my head dirty. It's too, you know. <laughs> so in other words, this is what we call it... Uh, Prabhupada used to call it hatchet. You know what a hatchet is, right? You know what they use for cutting wood? It's called an axe. So another word for an axe is a hatchet. A hatchet is a smaller axe. That's all it is. So the hatchet, when you're cutting wood, you go chuk 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 chuk. So Prabhupada said, what is this hatchet? <laughs> So we go down, we come back up. So that is not really obeisances, it's just some yoga uh, exercise or something. So we need to be more uh, complete when we offer obeisances. We can do full obeisances, which is called dandavats, means flowing flat like a stick. Or generally for ladies, they do the normal obeisances with the, it's called five points. There's five points and 11 points. Five points is your, your head, your uh, your two hands, and your two feet. That's called the five points. Or seven points with the two knees, like that. And then the Bandavats is 11 points. That's where your whole body is flat on the ground. So this is a very important part of Krishna consciousness. And I usually see some devotees, they don't even go all the way down. They get close to the floor. <laughs> <laughs> they think, I've seen this, even with senior devotees, like that. I know one devotee, he used to always go like, and he'd be at least six inches from the floor and come back up. You know. <laughs> so this is not, this is really, I mean, it's kind of a lazy way to do it. <laughs> 
but it doesn't really have the same effect because we never saw great souls do that. When they pay our obeisances, they do it properly. And this is important to do that, like that. And then Krishna promises that if you follow these four principles and work to develop them, you will come to me without fail, he says. Why? Because you're my very dear friend. He's talking to Arjuna in this sense. But he's referring to every living entity is very much related to Krishna. So therefore, Krishna is the friend of everyone because he's, he gives you what you need. The word, the word friend in Sanskrit has three different translations. Mitra, Banda, Bandhu, Bandhu, Mitra, and uh, uh, Suhit, Suhit. So, Bandhu means just a casual friend, you know, like you go to the store and you meet your, the guy who runs the business in the store, you, hey, Joe, how you doing, you know? <laughs> so that's like a casual friend. And then Mitra is a more, in, more closer friend. And then Suhit is the, is the ultimate principle of friend, which means it refers only to Krishna. Surit means, as Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, uh, what is that verse? Bhaktaram um, mm-hmm. Yagya Tapasam Sarvaloka Mahesham Suhidam Sarvadehinam Sarvabhutanam Yantamam Shantam Rijtite. So he says, I am, I am the friend of all living entities, and he uses the word su, suridam. So. So therefore, he is the ultimate friend. Why? Because he knows what you need and he can provide what you need. Like that. So Krishna is the best friend of all living beings. So this is the essence of the teachings of Bhagavad Gita. We went to this first so we could bring out this point of showing where the essence of Bhagavad Gita lies. And it lies in this particular verse. Like that. So these four principles, Prabhupada said, there's nothing outside of bhakti. These four principles contain everything in the process of bhakti, like that. Okay, you're just in time for questions, okay. (laughs) What's your question? Okay. Why is the day so short? Yeah, that's true. But they say time is relative to your consciousness. So for some people, time is slow. And for some people, time is fast. Depends on your consciousness. If you are happy, time goes fast. If you are unhappy, time goes slow. And if you wait, time stops. <laughs> yeah, it becomes, yeah. And if you love, time is eternal. Then there's no time. And you lose, then you lose all section. When you're in love, then love, then there's no time anymore. Yeah, so... Uh, so, yeah, so for some, each of us have a particular uh, conception of time based on the level of our consciousness. But generally, if a devotee is nicely engaged in devotional service and working steadily, we always think, oh, I wish I had more time to do more activities in devotional service. I wish I didn't have to spend so much time taking care of this body. That's another feel a feature of trying to expand our time like that. Yeah. But time is short, especially in Kali Yuga. I mean, we li- we hear we hear in such a yuga people live up to one hundred thousand years. So you might think how is a body can last? But the atmosphere was good and people were living according to 
the ecological balance of nature. Everyone was in tune with nature. Now, if you're in tune with nature, you're pretty much a rare species. <laughs> because we live in these buildings, and which are really very unhealthy. And we have all these electrical wires cross, crisscrossing all the way across the world, which are sapping the energy of people. And, you know, 5G, 4G, 6G, GG, G whiz, G whiz. <laughs> so this, you know, this, oh, this, uh, we live in a very unhealthy computers, cell phones, all these things are really sapping the energy and life force of the, the living entity. We live in a very artificial lifestyle. The world is really in a mess. <laughs> it's a complete mess. And coronavirus was just coming in to let you know, you guys are really screwed up. So I'm just going to show you how screwed up you are. <laughs> so really, we are. We're really, we don't know how to live. We don't know how to treat each other. We don't know how to treat animals. We don't know how to treat the environment. We don't know how to eat. We can't sleep properly. We're always disturbed. We have so many problems. And uh, it goes on. There's a whole list of anomalies in this age. It's just this age is so bad. So people would live 100,000 years in Satya Yuga. Valmiki Muni meditated for 60,000 years. In, uh, in uh, the Treta Yuga, people live for 10,000 years. In uh, Dupara Yuga, people live up to a thousand years. And you see, if you read some of the biblical stories about some of the persons in the Bible, you know, they lived 500, 600, 700 years. You can, you can, they have their, that's recorded in, in the parts of the Bible, how some of these personalities lived between five and 700, 800 years. And that was obviously a previous yuga. In this yuga, if you live a hundred years, you're considered to be old. <laughs> but that's nothing, a hundred years. That's fast. That's really quick. And so we, we, we live very short lives. That's why it says in Kali Yuga, your lives are shorter, your memory is shorter. What's your name again? <laughs> what's, my, what's my name? I forgot. <laughs> Memory is short, life is short, um, mercifulness is reduced, and bodily strength is now reduced. People are just like weaklings. They have no strength at all. They're getting sick all the time. So we're in a really deficient age. This is the age of Kali. It's really deficient, and it's, getting, it's only going to get worse. So Prabhupada said, don't stick around. Finish up your life in this world, the this time, and go back to Godhead. You don't want to be around for the rest of Kali Yuga. <laughs> it only gets worse. Oh. So, yeah. So people don't live very long nowadays. That's the way it is. Some people die at even, like... 30s, 50s, I think the average age of death in India, at least it was during Prabhupada's time, the average person lived to 35 years old. That was in India. In America, it was something like 70, something like that. And people don't even reach 100, what to speak about, getting to, you know, 100. Very difficult age. So there's only one way, is practicing bhakti in a very determined way. We should be very serious in our execution of bhakti. Making sure we use all of our time in service. This is one of the features of a devotee. He thinks, am I using my time in the best possible way? Am I thinking of Krishna? Am I serving Krishna? Am I doing something in relationship to Krishna? Now that's a reflection on our uh, 
way to improve our Krishna consciousness. Always take inventory like that. Okay, so um, any any comments, questions like that? Uh, I just oh Hare Krishna. I just want that missing just came across. You said that at Prabhupada's time, the average church was 35. So in like, India, yeah, in India. So I don't know. I don't know, but. It doesn't seem logical because they, at that time there were no TV, no internet, so they were living not in big cities, they were living more aligned with farming, living style. So how come that they were living so, but if you maybe have some idea. I don't know. Uh. That puzzles me too. <laughs> but Prabhupada even says it in a lecture, the average age was 35. People died young for some reason. Maybe lack of proper medical care. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, or whatever, for whatever reasons. Mm -hmm. yeah, there were lots of different diseases which are not in yeah. the West, like this polio. <coughs> Yeah, and sometimes, you know, uh, people would, for maybe for spiritual reasons, people were not living so long. Krishna would take back a soul who was, you know, young to give them a chance to go back to Godhead at a young age, not have to live it through the whole life if they were ready to go back. But duration of life in terms of age is really is not significant in relationship to the, to the principle of successful life. The idea is whatever time you have, use it for Krishna. And Krishna will allow you to become fully perfect if you use your time and then he'll take you back. But if you waste time, then he may cut your life short just so you can get another body and start all over again. Yes, any other questions? Hare Krishna. Uh, Hare Krishna Hajj. <clears throat> Regarding these activities which are mentioned in this shloka, I'm gonna bother my back too. Um, have you ever heard that these activities are in some sequence? Hmm? Are they in some sequence? These are which are the oh, list. Oh, the or four just, activities. Yes, this this four which are here mentioned as a, the most confidential and the most. Mm -hmm. Well, these four. This is the confidential part of knowledge. So this constitutes that, but to here. In the sense that they're like put in the process, like from it seem, Shada to Prema. It, seem, it seems like it's the reverse. First you pay obeisance, then you worship Krishna, then you become his devotee, then you can always think of him. <laughs> it seems like it's in the opposite way. So giving, them, giving the complete one first and then going the other way. How is uh, is there some connection with the twelfth chapter, that sequence of shlokas from eight to eleven? Um, well, if you can't do this, do yes, this. Yes, yes, you yes. can't do this, do this. Um, no, these are all four. Of these are required. It's not like you can pick, because this this eighteenth chapter is more or less a culmination of everything Krishna said before. So he's giving the ultimate principle now. And then in the next verse, he says, surrender to me. So I have a question. When Krishna says, abandon all varieties of religion and just surrender unto me, uh, you sh uh, uh, what does he mean by abandoning all varieties of religion? Does he mean to give up religion? What is the meaning of that? 
something to think about. So next verse, which is considered to be one of the, the a culminating verse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not talking about religion, no? Hmm? Dharma doesn't necessarily mean religion. Dharma means, comes from the word D, D-H-I-H, -H, which means essence. Mm -hmm. The essence of something is his dharma. As Prabhupada said, the dharma of sugar is sweet, the dharma of chili is pungent, the dharma of water is liquidity. The dharma of the living entity is to love and serve the Lord. So dharma means, uh, means and so the word sanatan dharma, eternal essence. So the eternal essence of the living being is to serve, love and serve the Lord. So dharma really means essence. So what, what that, now, if you now uh, um, state, what would that mean in context of Varna Ashrama Dharma? What would be the essence? Well, Varna Ashrama Dharma is a, that also, as it, as a, that deals with uh, Swadharma. Because Varna and is Swadharma. Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Sutra are your material dharmas. Also means the essence, as you mentioned? Yeah, material essence, yeah. Everyone has a particular uh, nature, and that nature is your swadharma, or your material essence, falling into one of these four categories. Mm -hmm. But in Kali Yuga is mentioned that all, there are no pure varnas. We all sh shudras are so, yeah. yeah. mixed. Well, yeah, we're mixed, or we're... No but one the, is following the, you know, the process of... But everyone has a dharma, though, and it's covered because of the age of Kali. And that's mm -hmm. why Prabhupada said we need training to bring out your swadharma. Training came, comes in the form of giving education based on activities <coughs> related to your dharma, to your essence. In other words, uh, to teach the different activities within the four varnas and bring out the proclivities of the, the individuals who are taking the teachings. And that's, ob that's observed both by the teachings and by the teacher who observes the students to see what is their nature. Some people's nature you can really tell easy. And others, you can't. <laughs> mm -hmm. you, yours are easy. Yours, yours are easy. That's why you're the perfect temple president. <laughs> if anybody says any, anything about you being temple president, they know nothing about Varnashram Dharma. <laughs> you fit the role perfectly. <laughs> I really need it now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you have that leadership quality, and you also have a managerial ability. And so you combine both of those things, and it seems natural to you. It's not something you you really had to learn. Maybe you learned a little bit about it when you... But it's in your character. I can see that it's easy to see that. That's your character. You have leadership qualities, and you also have a, uh, an organizational nature. You like to organize things. Now you really obliged me <laughs> in the front of the theaters. <laughs> well, you know, you, you know. With your blessings, maybe someday I will become candidate for that. <laughs> well, we, we can we can always get better at it. <laughs> But if I look around the room, I can't tell anybody else's nature. <laughs> I, yours are very distinct. But there are persons I can really tell their nature really easy. It's easy to see. And others, it's, you can sit there for years trying to figure it out. <laughs> Scared, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean... There are people, just like Gujaratis, they have this Vaishya nature. You, you know, it doesn't matter how much money they have, they have to keep doing business. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You know, I, we had a, I know one person, who I knew him really good, and he had, you know, millions of dollars, 
And he could have retired, but he said, no, no, I got to make more money. <laughs> because it's not that he needs more money or was greedy for money. It's just the, this is nature. <laughs> he was working according to his nature. <laughs> <laughs> My nature is to tell jokes. That's in the <laughs> oh, that's, that's another varna. <laughs> it's not part of the it's four. Not, not <laughs> 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 that has something to do with another part of my character, <laughs> which I won't say anything about. <laughs> <laughs> You're not supposed to say anything. <laughs> but, yeah, and then, but, of course, Kali Yuga covers the, the dharmas, the, the swadharmas, and therefore training is required. Training and evaluation <coughs> by senior devotees like that. How another question regarding the Dharma and Swadharma. How our conditioned nature interferes with our devotional practice? When it we can. have this yoga yoga ladder in the Gita. You have to align your nature with your your practice. That way then you become very creative in your practice. Yeah. What that means Sarva Dharma that you have to reject all other dharmas. Because in the beginning we have like sakama, we have full of desires, and we are very attached to activity. Mm -hmm. And then we pro when we progress in in uh, in the consciousness, then we come to the nishkama, where we are not anymore attached neither to the fruit, neither neither to the activity. Right? Yeah, that's nishkama bhakti. Yeah. Yeah, sakama, nishkama, karma, yoga, and then mm. it comes to the to the. To yeah. The, so the question. Uh, so what the question is? So, <coughs> or the point you're making? Yeah, is? you mentioned that we have to be engaged according to our svadharma, right? Conditioned nature. That's ideal. But, but when consciousness mm. is raised, we have high consciousness. Then we can do for Krishna whatever is needed. Right. No. Yeah. Is this correct? Yeah, that's how Prabhupada started the movement. But then he said. We need to institute this with him. because uh, in 1974 he said, you know, chanting, people are chanting Hare Krishna, but they're going away. Mm. So now we have to establish this vanar, this Daivi Vanarshram. That's in 1974 he changed. Before them, he rejected any kind of activity of Vanarshram. He said, just chant Hare Krishna. That's enough. But he said, when he saw the devotees were chanting Hare Krishna and still not making advancement, he understood that we need to uh, uh, engage people according to their nature. And that way they'll be more inclined to stay engaged in devotional service and become more creative and more productive all at the same time. So that's Prabhupada's unfinished business. But people who work in that nature of theirs, they're the most happy and the most creative because they're resonating with their actual, you know, conditioned nature, but they're dovetailing that conditioned nature in devotional service, therefore it becomes purified, becomes spiritual. One question arises this now here. Why chanting is not enough? That means that somehow the other one ashrama is more powerful than the holy name. No, you need, both, you need both logic. together. If you do just Varnashram, you're not going to grain. You need b both the chanting and the, and, the, uh, and the engagement according to your nature. Both have to be there. Because the chanting purifies the heart and mind, where the activities awakens one's natural tendency to serve. Mm -hmm. You see that sometimes people... Serve in, they like to serve in a certain way. I mean, they really resonate with a certain type of service. 
I mean, it was when people, I've seen devotees who really work according to their nature, they do amazing service. Amazing service. Because they really get into it, they like it, and they they get ideas on how to expand that and like that. And they feel happy doing that. So, yeah, there is that statement by Prabhupada. That comes up on that presentation by uh, Sureshwar. Well, he makes that point that Prabhupada, 1974, was very concerned that devotees, they were chanting, but still not advancing. Some of them were going away. So now he felt we need to develop that other side. Before then, Prabhupada was just pushing people to work according to what was needed. And there was a lot of criticism, not a lot, but some criticism from senior devotees that uh, were putting the needs of the society before the needs of the individual. And we still do that to some degree. But then we saw that that doesn't work. The devotees were not, they were surrendering, but they were not growing. They were not progressing because they weren't getting their needs taken care of. So that was an emergency type of thing that was done because Prabhupada was, he had three heart attacks. He was thinking, you know, I could go at any moment. So we have to really, Prabhupada pushed hard to, to spread the movement before he left. Really hard. And Krishna, Prabhupada said, Krishna gave me 10 more years to do it. Before then, I mean, 1967, the, when he had his th third heart attack, the doctor said that was it. He was supposed to go at that time. But he said, uh, Prabhupada said, I prayed to Krishna. I, my mission is, you know, not even begun yet. So Prabhupada knew who he was. He knew that he was empowered to do this work. But at the same time, his health was a challenge. And so Krishna, he said, Krishna gave me 10 more years. So when he left America in 1967 to go to India to regain his health, the devotees weren't sure if they would ever see Prabhupada again. And there was a, there was a really a very sad time. Devotees were very, very unhappy, praying, will we ever see Prabhupada again? But Prabhupada came back, and his health was like, wow really good. Whatever happened in India, I'm not sure of that history, but mm -hmm. Prabhupada really got his health together, came back, and he was, then he started to really push the movement. And of course, during that time when he was here, during his 10 years, his health was always a challenge. But somehow how he maintained it so it wouldn't uh, interfere with his preaching. But he had a lot of problems. So, yeah, Prabhupada pushed. He did. And he knew it. He was taking chances. He gave people sannyas that he felt that were not ready for sannyas, but still they had certain tendencies. He took chances and he pushed the devotees. But he said, I, I was always praying to Krishna to protect the devotees. So then, now that we have established an infrastructure, in other words, we have buildings, we have resources, we have uh, devotees, we don't have to go that route anymore to push people. We have to now engage people according to their how best that they can make advancement. So that's the formula, and that's the, that's the goal now to get away from this just doing service, but to actually work according to your nature. So that's something we're still trying to develop yet. It takes time. And it takes education. <laughs> you tired? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Traveling? You were traveling, huh? Coming from a long way? Oh. Oh, work, yeah. And nowadays, things are really tough in the, in the world. 
Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So we can maybe... Is there any further discussions on this? Uh, did, did we cover everything we wanted to? Okay. All right, we can stop here. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki jai. His Holiness Chandra Maharaj ki jai.